Hello everyone. So in this session, we're going to talk about art history. I'm going to give you an introduction about uh, some of the things we do, some of the approaches we take, um, and I'll give you plenty of examples so that everything is, uh, is is clear. So I think the first thing you want to think about when you think about art history is that in some ways uh, it's a separate discipline, uh, but it it hooks up and it, it uh, touches upon all sorts of different disciplines. So in this class, we're going to be using, uh, we're going to be looking at art, we're going to be looking at objects throughout history, um, but we're also going to be talking about philosophy, we're going to talk about literature, we're going to talk about anthropology, we're going to talk about paleontology, uh, we're going to talk about pure history, and we're going to talk about sociology, uh, we're going to talk about economics. There are so many themes and so many different disciplines that intersect uh, in the history of art uh, that odds are you already have, even if you don't care about art yet, you already have a pre-existing interest that will in some ways touch upon art. Because think about it, we have all these objects throughout time, throughout history, throughout different cultures, as you're gonna, as you're gonna see with your timeline objects. Um, they all in some ways open access to a whole world, a whole culture, a whole other time that, in, that involve different philosophies, different literatures, different economies, different views on history, different understandings of even what it means to be human um, and what, what it means to live on this, on this planet. So necessarily in this course, we're going to be using a lot of different methods and we're going we're to dip into a lot of different disciplines. So that's the first thing you want to think about uh, in a most general sense, at least the way I understand and the way I teach art history, that it's very multidisciplinary. The other thing I like to stress is that we're going to be studying and becoming really attuned to objects, to the way things look, um, um, and to history itself, to times past and to uh, times present. And so broadly speaking, what we do uh, in this class is that we're, we're doing a form of ecological thinking in the broadest sense. We understand, we're trying to understand how the world affects us and in turn, by turn, uh, how we affect the, the world because each and every one of us, we're, we're like a point, we're a node, uh, we're a moment in space and time um, that means something. And that's surrounded by other things that, that, that have meaning. Uh, again, both back in time, in history, but also in the present. So one of the things, one of the big things I like to uh, try to stress at the beginning of this class is to say that when you become more visually attuned and when you become more attuned to ideas and to history, um, not only will you start to understand how history is still working on you, is still in some ways coercing you or forming uh, forms of thought that maybe you didn't you, you didn't think about before uh, but it all also give you a whole new way of looking at the world and a whole new like set of tools uh, to be able to, to to be able to navigate the world so we talk a lot about you know literacy uh, and people being able to read uh, and write and so on and so forth and of course that's incredibly important uh, but visual literacy is also incredibly important being able to use your eyes and your mind to visually now navigate the world is, is, really, uh, is really important, especially in our era of uh, the internet and images are everywhere um, and we have deep fakes and we have uh, this whole ecology, this whole media ecology that we're immersed in, that we would be well served to navigate it as intelligently um, and as astutely as we can. So while we're, while we're going to look at a lot of old objects, while we're looking at, we're dipping way back into history for most of this class, always keep in mind that even the most distant thing in some ways is teaching you to become more visually attuned, and that will allow you to be more visually attuned to the, to the present, right? So um, in the broadest sense, this class is uh, trying to cultivate a form of ecological, ecological, ecological thinking, of knowing where we are within, within the world, both in time, um, and, and in space. So let's get to some more specifics. One way I really like to introduce art history and what art objects are and what they can do to us uh, and what they, um, what they supply us is to make an analogy. Um, and I, I, my, um, my specialty, what I work on, is animals in art, especially animals in 20th century and contemporary 
art. So um, um, I'm both an art historian and a critical animal studies scholar. So studying the role of animals within history and culture and politics and so on and so forth. And so I like to start with this analogy. Um, back in the 50s or 60s, uh, Claude Levi Strauss, a very famous anthropologist, he's a famous quote. He says, animals are good to think with. And what he means by this is that he, he thinks that animals within culture, the way in which human cultures understand or treat or uh, encode or, or live with animals says a lot about that culture. There's something about the, the rapport and the relationship with animals in the natural world for Levi Strauss, um, where he thinks that this tells us a lot about a culture, um, about a, a human societies, the way they understand animals. And he's an anthropologist, right? So he's studying uh, humans and human societies, right? So he thinks animals are very, very important to understand um, in order to understand uh, uh, human cultures and, and, and anthropology. Well, I want you to think the same thing uh, when it comes to art. Artworks are good to think with. Artworks open up a whole trove of different meanings and a trove of different registers, and we're going to go through them today. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, you're, you're going to think about artworks almost like an onion after today, where you just keep peeling back layers and the work just keeps getting more and more in depth and it's giving you more and more and more. So artworks are good to think with. When we try to understand societies and history and politics and really the whole kind of human experience uh, of these many, many centuries that we're still a part of, one of the great ways to do it is to look at the objects that were deemed to be so important that they were carefully made um, that they were stored, that, that eventually they'll become in museums, um, and today the, the, many of them are incredibly valuable, some of them priceless, right? These are very important objects, uh, and so they tell you a lot about um, the peoples and the cultures and, and the histories and the societies and the politics that they were embedded in, right? So when you go to a museum, you're not just looking at a statue or a painting or a video or a photograph or whatever. Uh, it really is a portal onto a whole slew of different meanings uh, and a whole slew of different worlds, uh, worldviews and perspectives on what it means to live, uh, some of which are, some of them are, are completely gone, right? And all we have left are the vestiges of these objects that were deemed to be so important. So like animals, for Levi Strauss, think of artworks as good to think with. Right? This class is very much about thinking through history and these, and these objects. And so let's pursue this al analogy a little bit further because it goes way deeper, um, this analogy between art and animals. So uh, for one thing, both art and animals demand something from us. Um, they both demand protection. They both demand conservation. Um, they both are objects that are kind of like unlike anything else um, on, on the planet. Um, no big deal, I suppose, if you have, um, um, I don't know, a, a leaf on the ground and then, uh, you, you know, you just, you just uh, pile up your leaves and then in the fall and then you burn them. No big deal. Who cares about these leaves, right? Although so you could be attentive to leaves. They're, they can be very beautiful. Uh, but it's very different uh, than if a pangolin came up to you, um, if you go visit Iceland. There's something about this pangolin uh, that's quite incredible, right? Um, and there are all sorts of ways in which pangolins, which happen to be now endangered species, they demand, our, th there's something about them that they, they demand our protection, they demand our conservation. Uh, I usually, in class, when we, when we do this live, this usually is a. This usually turns into a really interesting discussion about what it would mean um, for pangolins to be totally extinct. Like, why would that matter? Why is that something we might not want to happen? Right? There are all sorts of reasons uh, why we might want not want this to happen. Um, so there's something about animals that demands something from us, and it's the same thing with art objects. Um, who cares about like uh, a magazine uh, and a, an, an advertisement that you've seen over and over and over again? Uh, who cares? You just like uh, throw it in the trash, right? But if you had um, uh, a Leonardo da Vinci 
in your attic that was lost, <laughs> first of all, you could just quit class and just retire because uh, it would be priceless and you can just sell it for and live on it for the rest of your life. Uh, but you would also treat it very, very differently than some some other object in your in your attic, right? You you'd, you'd protect it. There's something about it that 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 demands uh, conservation. And so art and animals work in tandem that way, in an interesting way. Um, they both also elicit various emotions in us. Now, all sorts of things elicit emotions, uh, especially other people, right? Other human beings. But there is something specific that we want to be attentive to. Um, that's this. Uh, uh, that, that are these emotions that that um, that fly off the page or the canvas, or the statue or the photograph or the video. Um, they're meant to be there. They're meant to affect you in some ways. And you want to be attentive to that. In the same way, or in similar ways, uh, and when you, as, as when you look at this, this, little, uh, this little kitten, uh, there, there is some sort of emotion, there's some sort of affect. that might not be the same for everybody. But the, there is some sort of emotion that's elicited when you see this little kitten face. Um, and if you saw this actual kitten in person, and if you were, you pet the kitten, you would both release um, oxytocin, and you would both have these like uh, happy moods, right? There is a way in which um, 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 being with an animal, uh, it's well known, um, can be very therapeutic. It has an affect on you. It makes you feel uh, certain ways, and often... Uh, it, it uplifts your mood. And so both animals and art elicit emotions in us, and we want to be attentive to those emotions, right? Whatever they might be, um, art is not always going to be this beautiful thing. Um, art is going to elicit all sorts of different emotions in us. And so we want to be attentive to that in the same way that a poem or a film um, or a great work of literature elicits certain types of emotions in us, right? So in this class, we're going to be doing a lot of thinking um, and even analytical, critical work, but we're also going to be attentive to those that other part of those other parts of life that have to do with emotion, that have to do with feelings, um, and that have to do with, you know, what it means to be um, like this kitten, um, um, a thing that experiences the world in various ways, um, an emotional, an emotional creature. There's also a way in which um, you can make an analogy between animals. So here you're seeing a bat, uh, a parrot, um, some cetaceans, two bottlenose dolphins, and a pig. Um, they give us access to the world almost uh, in like, um, like a, a sideways view. Um, we know now. Uh, scientists know that these three animals, well, we know a lot less about bats, uh, that these animals are incredibly intelligent and that they do have a position on the world. Like they do see the world. They have an intelligence. They have certain forms of logic. In the case of parrots, they can actually use human speech. That's been confirmed now. But they have other modes of communication that are not speech, right? And so there are some ways in which if you're attentive to pigs, parrots, dolphins, bats, whatever it is, these other minds out there, the human minds are not the only minds on this planet. There are other minds. There are non-human minds. There's a wonderful way in which these creatures give us access to the world in a way that's different from the way we access it. We may very well access it differently. We may very well have a more complex um, uh, way of, of understanding and living in the world. Uh, but nonetheless, it's not the only way, right? So, so if, if you study parrots, it gives you another access, another way of seeing the world, which is wonderful. But it's the same thing with art. Every art object that you come across is an opportunity to see the world in a different way, in a way that you uh, don't normally see it, right? It's a way of actually expanding the way you see the world and understand the world, right? So I love this. It's another way in which this analogy between art and animals works quite uh, quite well. And speaking of communication, um, both animals and art, they both involve forms of communication. Most of the time, this is not always the time, because uh, there are some animals out there that can use human speech, like parrots. Um, 
they involve forms of communication that are outside of speech. They have to be, they're forms of language that have to be decoded in other ways. So I give you an image, this incredible, like powerful scientific photograph of a bee, of a, of a, of a honeybee. And in the 70s, there's a very famous ethologist. Ethologist is someone who studies the, the animal behavior, who understood that bees will do a little dance to communicate to other bees where the good pollen is, where the good stuff is out there. Um, so they actually communicate to each other through this little dance. So they don't say, hey, the pollen's like, you know, uh, that way. They'll do this little wiggle dance uh, with their abdomen to communicate this, right? So it, it took forever. It took uh, centuries for, for us to understand what this meant. And uh, we had to decode it in other ways, right? Um, it's the same thing when when we're talking about the visual arts. If it's a painting, if it's a photograph, if it's an installation, if it's a sculpture, to understand the way it's communicating to you, you have to decode it in ways that are not a speech. You have to visually decode it, right? It's a visual form of communication. So there's yet another way in which this analogy between art and animals works uh, really, really well in a compelling, um, in a compelling way. And then there are more ways we could run with this analogy, but I'll end with this one, um, and it's kind of the big one. History. Uh, both art and animals give us a glimpse into our past, into our history. Animals, um, since uh, Charles Darwin in the 19th century, we now understand that animals, all sorts of different animals, that we live on a continuum, um, that they give us access to an evolutionary history. Um, that in some ways there's this whole uh, tree um, or structure of life uh, and all these incredible homologies um, um, that have evolved throughout a really, really deep time um, that give us access to the way in which we were formed as these really high level, um, these high level human beings on this planet. And so animals give us access to our history. We wouldn't know about uh, the way in which we evolved, the way our anatomy works, the way our biology works, without uh, primates, without um, um, other mammals, um, without all sorts of other creatures out there that give us, in some ways, a roadmap to ev evolutionary history of this planet. And even this jellyfish that you're seeing on the screen here, um, your stomach which we're learning all sorts of stuff about now. It's very, go out and read about it. It's really fascinating, our gut microbiome. Um, the way in which our gut microbiome, especially when you treat it well, it turns out the gut microbiome really likes fiber uh, for all these bacteria that, that feed on fiber um, and these good um, uh, fatty acids. All these things are really good, not only for like digestion, but it's it's really good for uh, overall well-being and even mood. Some ninety to ninety-five percent of serotonin is produced in the gut, and there's something called the gut-brain axis uh, that connects the gut with your with your brain. Right? There's a way in which it communicates. There's some scientists that even call our guts, our gut microbiome, our second brain. Um, so this is really compelling. And we also know that our guts uh, are these very advanced, evolved nerve nets that have a long evolutionary history. There's one scientist who says, actually, we shouldn't be calling our gut microbiome our second brain. We should call it our first brain because before brains like ours developed in, in, in time, um, our stomachs developed first. Uh, a jellyfish is basically a rudimentary nerve net that's similar to the way our stomach functions. So it's incredible. Those jellyfish that still now, um, they're proliferating because they, they, they do really well with global warming. They are in some ways part of our ancestral history of our insides, of these nerve nets that are our, um, our, our microbiomes. So that's just one example where if you're attentive to an animal, and here in this case a jellyfish, it opens up on this whole history of what it means to have a, like a human body, in this case, a gut microbiome and all that means. Fascinating stuff. I highly recommend uh, reading up on it a little bit in the scientific literature. Well, it's very clear how this applies to art objects, I think, right? Uh, because in the same way, uh, we can go back and look at Paleolithic cave paintings, these first uh, works of art. Well, they wouldn't, even, they wouldn't have been considered works of art, uh, but the, these first images and these first paintings on cave walls that are earliest 
ancestors decided they should have up there, that they, they should make very mysterious stuff, right? Um, this tells us a lot about our past, about our history, and the first moment where we decided as a species to start making these images, right? And then, of course, you can work your way all, all back up to the 20th century and the 21st century. All these art objects, all these incredible artists throughout time, in some ways are trying to tell us something about our history. Um, and if we're patient and we're, if we do the work and, we're, and we kind of, we sit here with wonder, um, history can open up to us and we can understand our own history. And of course, other cultures, uh, the history of other cultures, when we're talking about a more recent version of time. So that's it, uh, as far as the, the art animal analogy, which I find so compelling. Uh, and in class, it's always, this is always a really wonderful discussion uh, to have with students. So uh, if you want to add anything to this, uh, do so in comments or discussion. And so now uh, I want to go, we're moving from this more philosophical, speculative introduction to art history. I think you can tell we've been dealing with some big ideas here so far. Um, for the second half of, of this introduction, I want to give you like a toolbox that you're going to be using throughout the whole semester. These aren't the only tools that you're going to be using. You're going to keep accruing tools as we go along. Um, you're just going to keep having different ways of interpreting um, art and history. But this is a good Base. This is a good um, initial to toolbox to have. Um, and we're going to go from the most concrete and simple tools to interpret art all the way to probably some of the more complicated and complex. Um, and when you're interpreting or trying to understand a work of art, you're, you're going to be you're going to try to do all of this. You're going to try to do it all in tandem. Right. So this should be very helpful. Um, for any of the assignments that we have in this class and for any discussions that you have um, 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 about, about uh, the lectures and, and the objects that, that, that we study. So from the simplest to the most complex. And we're going to, so that it's very clear, we're going to stay with one work um, and, and, and build on it. Again, almost like an onion. We're just going to peel back the layers of complexity here. So the first thing you would ask uh, about an art object, if you're in a museum, is, well, what's the name, what's the title, and when is it from, right? These are things that are, that are good to know right off the bat, and in some ways the simplest thing to know, although we don't always know it. Sometimes we don't know the artist, and then it's just anonymous. Um, sometimes the time period is very wide, we have to kind of guess. But in this case, um, we're looking at Jacques-Louis David, who we're going to study in this class, a neoclassical uh, painter, and this is the death of Socrates which is at the Met. It's one of their great paintings. And so that's very simple. Now you know who made this. Now you know the name of it. Now you know more or less what art movement it's from. The next thing you would ask is, what is it made of? What's the materiality? What are the materials, right? This can get very complicated, especially with contemporary art. Uh, but for the most part, the materials are also quite straightforward. Here uh, we have oil, paint, on canvas. And this sounds very simple, and in some ways it is, uh, but just be aware as we study the history of painting in this class, painting doesn't start out as oil painting, and painting doesn't start out on canvas. So oil paint on canvas has a very different quality than, say, tempera paint as a fresco, right, or watercolor, um, or whatever it might be. So being attentive to the material also already tells you quite a bit about the way um, the artwork looks and the way the object looks. Um, and here's another example of what materiality could be in a work of art. This is a contemporary work of art. Uh, this is Douglas Gordon. It's called 24-Hour Psycho. I've seen it. It's a great uh, um, video installation. So it's a video. There's a screen that hangs in the middle of the room. Um, and I think you can guess what you're seeing. If you've never seen this film, it's a classic uh, Hollywood film. Uh, really kind of the first thriller horror film ever made that freaked everybody out in this country in 1960. This is Hitchcock's Psycho. And so what he did, he slowed it down so that it would last, instead of the two-hour normal running time, he slowed it down so that it would last two hours. I mean, I'm sorry, it would last 24 hours. It would last the whole day. Um, which makes you very aware of the materiality of the film itself. Normally, the frames you don't see here because it's so slow, you see 
um, you see the frames. And I'm going to pause it there because this is where it gets really scary. And so as an example of materiality, uh, this would be a video uh, channel, a film transferred to a video channel, right? Which is very different uh, material than oil on paint, right? Okay, so the other thing you would ask uh, is what's, what's the form? How did, how did the artist work with the materials that he or she had? Um, what style did they use? And this is where you go back to this term from before. What is the affect? What are the moods that are elicited um, in you? And so for the death of Socrates, you would talk about the color, uh, you would talk about the composition. It's a very rational, highly ordered composition. Um, it's like that wonderful Radiohead song, everything in its right place. Um, even though this, sound, this seems like something of a chaotic scene, if you went in and analyzed the composition, everything balances out beautifully, perfectly. Everything uh, works with everything else. Uh, so you would talk about the composition. You would talk about the brush stroke. Do you see brush strokes or do you not see brush strokes? Is it so well rendered that you don't even notice that it's paint? You're almost mistaking it for actual flesh, right? Like the torso of Socrates here. And, uh, and speaking of Socrates, does this look like an old man um, who's about to be uh, put to death in Athens in the 5th century? Not really, right? He looks uh, very, very fit. Uh, and this, we, and he looks like you know, yeah, it's the uh, like a very beautiful human form, right? This we would call uh, stylistically a form of idealization. David is idealizing this figure um, um, through 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 his body, right, and through this uh, near perfect human human form, perfect in quotes, right. Um, so it's not abstract at all. It's naturalistic. I mean, you almost mistake these for actual human bodies. Is it two-dimensional, three-dimensional? Is it really meticulous? Is it, is it haphazard? Is it cold or is it warm? Is it ordered or chaotic? All these things are the things you would ask about at the level of form, style, um, and affect right? for any work. Um, and here's another work, uh, very contemporary. Um, you, could, you could talk about uh, what sort of... Uh, what sort of mood, what sort of feel, what sort of vibe this work has that's distinct from like a David. Um, it would be very, very different, right? Very different descriptive words and very different vibes coming from this work. Um, I, think that's, I think that's quite clear, right? But just like the David, these are the, the, the composition, the color, the feel, um, the decisions that the artist has made. All these things are part of the form and the style um, and the emotional affect of the work, right? Then we move on to meaning. Um, iconography is a, is a word uh, that means, icon means image and graphy means writing. Um, so you want to think of it as writing and images. But in the broadest sense, iconography um, means that what you're seeing refers back to some sort of text or some sort of story, right? So these aren't just any uh, these aren't just a bunch of dudes in a jail, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, whatever you might think they're doing. Uh, these are, this is very specific. It comes from Plato's Phaedo. It comes from the cycle of Plato's dialogues that have to do with Socrates, especially his trial and his, his being put to death. And so you can't really understand this painting if you haven't read Plato's Phaedo and if you don't know a little bit about Platonic philosophy. Um, and this will be the case for almost everything we look at in this class. So here's another example. The iconography here. Um, do you know who this is? This is a, a man who's either about to be spit out or swallowed by uh, a whale. It's a very famous little marble sculpture that's at the Cleveland Museum of Art. If you guessed that it was uh, Jonah, uh, Jonah and the whale, you, you would guess right. And so what we're dealing with here is Judeo-Christian iconography, right? Um, a story that comes um, from Judeo-Christian scripture. The other thing that we do, and now we're starting to get to more complicated, uh, complicated area, um, is that we start talking about the social history of the time that the object was made. So clearly, David is interested in Plato and is interested in Socrates and in the Phaedo. Otherwise, he never would have made this painting, right? And so uh, if we go further along those lines, 
we start to think, okay, well, this painting is tell telling us something about that time period. Um, it was made in 1785, um, the latter part of the 18th century. Well, what's going on then? Uh, what is this painting telling us about this 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 moment in uh, in Western history, right? One of the things that's that we do in social history, because it's had such a, a, a huge role in in uh, in human history and not only in the West, um, but that would be religion. Religion plays a huge role in the history of human culture, society, um, and and history, and so. With this example, if you started uh, interrogating it or examining it, what it tells us about uh, religion, this is, this is the moment of, of enlightenment. This is a historical moment of actually questioning religion and questioning theocratic rule. All these kings in Europe, in, in Europe um, who are kings because uh, of divine decree, because a god says that they are king, right? And so in this instance, uh, we're dealing with a painter that's within Enlightenment ideals, that's challenging religion. Um, and Socrates then becomes a story or a parable, or we might call it an allegory. It stand, it's a story that stands in for another story. Um, of Enlightenment, of this Enlightenment moment. It's well known, if you've read your Platonic Dialogues, that Socrates, one of the charges that's that's leveled against him and one of the reasons why he's put to death is because he's accused of corrupting the youth and of being impious of going against the um, um, the Greek gods well in some ways David and the Enlightenment and this moment in Europe was also going against established religion right so you see how this story from Greece David updates it and uses it as an allegory for his own moment Right, which is also a moment of questioning and uh, confronting re uh, religion. So this is one way to do social history. We start talking about well, how does religion? Uh, what role does religion play in this in this work? Right, um, and this is going to be everywhere, everywhere, almost throughout time until we get to the latter part of the nineteenth century and the twentieth century. Um, so in this instance, right, you may already know this is an incredible large. Uh, statue of the Buddha um, along the Silk Road and uh, you would not be able to understand this statue and the Bodhisattvas and all the iconography all the symbols and signs um, the long earlobes that designate uh, the princely past of Siddhartha Gautama uh, that he renounces to become a Buddha um, all of this you would not know if you didn't read and understand the story and the history of Buddhism Right? So religion plays a, a really monumental role, again, not only in the history of Western art, but in, in uh, the history of all different, different cultures, including um, the history of, of Buddhist, uh, Buddhist thought and, and, and Buddhist religion. So the other thing we do in social history, we don't only talk about uh, the way religion impacted art making um, and, and society, but of course we also talk about politics. Um, I think we all can feel the moment we're living in. Um, Historians, hopefully uh, years, decades, hopefully you know, cent a century from now, they're going to be trying to understand the moment that we're living through right now. And to be able to do it, they would have to know what Black Lives Matter is. They would have to know um, what it means for uh, Trump to be president. They would have to know what it means for Bolsonaro to be president in Brazil. They would have to know um, um, how politics played a role in uh, our fight to combat global warming. Um, they would have to understand how politics played a role in um, containing or not containing um, or dealing with uh, this horrible um, uh, coronavirus, right? So to understand 2020, you, you wouldn't be able to do it if you didn't understand how the, the politics of the time, everything that we're living through now, right? So I want you to think that way, but transpose it backwards to other moments in time. So it's not just religion. We cannot understand this painting until we know what was happening politically in uh, 1785, in the latter part of the 18th century, right? 
And so it's incredibly important to know that this is the moment of the French Revolution. This is actually the moment of, the, of all these great revolutions. The American Revolution just before. After this, you're going to have very, very soon after this, the Haitian Revolution, uh, the first colony to um, uh, revolt um, from, um, uh, fr from, from, a, from a superpower. Um, unless you count the United States, uh, but in this, in this case, a slave, a slave, a slave colony, um, the French Revolution. You would not be able to understand uh, this painting without understanding the, the French Revolution. And David is part of, oh, I misspoke, 1787, not 1785. Um, you wouldn't be able to understand this painting if you didn't know that David was a revolutionary. He was a Jacobin at the time, right? And so this is not only about a painting about questioning religions, uh, it's also uh, a symbol of Socrates sacrificing himself for his ideals. It's well known that he could have just paid a little fine and then left with his life, but he would have had re he would have had to recant his ideas. He would have had to admit that he was wrong, right? Something he wouldn't do. Uh, so he actually drank the hemlock and commits suicide and sacrifices himself to this ideal. Well, it's not a stretch to then start thinking of this painting uh, as a revolutionary painting, um, as David painting a figure who's sacrificing himself for an ideal that can be transposed onto these French revolutionaries who are sacrificing themselves to, um, to uh, overthrow this king and to create their own state, their own republic uh, that would be democratic, right? Um, so we can't understand this painting until we talk um, about about politics, right? There are all sorts of examples of, of, of works, of contemporary works that are that are political in this way. Um, this is a great one. Um, I think it's still ongoing uh, in Madison Square Park. This is Christoph Wodisko. Um, he does these wonderful works where he projects images onto statues, uh, you know, like these old statues, um, statues that are very much in the news. And what he does um, is he, the, the projection, he uses the statue almost like as a, as a, a screen for the projection of, of an individual. I mean, in this series, um, the individuals that are projected are, um, are refugees who tell their stories uh, about what they've gone through, right? Um, so there's a speaker there and you can actually hear them speaking in this pre-recorded video projection that, that, that uses the, the, um, the, the monument uh, more or less as a projection screen. And so this is an example of a contemporary work um, that's con certainly quite political. The other thing um, that we would talk about, and this is quite difficult to understand, usually. Uh, it's a difficult uh, idea um, or concept um, uh, to grasp, at least initially. But I hope I can make it um, worth your while and make sense of it for you. And this is ideology. So part of doing social history is not only in go going back to see what people thought and knew they were thinking, right? It, whether it's about religion, whether it's about clothing, or whether it's about politics, or whether it's about nature, whatever it is, right? Every, every moment in time, uh, human cultures, uh, nations, peoples, they all had like a common understanding um, that they understood, right? That they had in their minds. But there are all sorts of ideas that people have that they don't know they have. Like they're so deeply entrenched, a word for this would be dogmatic. To, ha to have dogma is to have a belief that is unquestioned. Um, or another way of thinking about this is to think that every moment in time, including our own time, there are all these unconscious desires and beliefs and forms of knowledge that people have without knowing that they have it. It's so deeply ingrained that they don't even see it, right? So your job as an art historian in this class is to go back and start questioning, okay, what am I seeing in this painting that the painter or the audience at that time could not have seen because it was so ideological. It was so deeply ingrained in their mind that they couldn't, couldn't see it at all, right? This is what ideology means. Um, and it comes from uh, Karl Marx, so one of the more important political philosophers um, in, 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 uh, in, in the West. Uh, Marx said his definition of ideology was they know not what they do. 
That was his definition of ideology. So again, ideology is any set of assumptions or beliefs that are held at any particular time, which are un uncritical, sometimes they're contradictory, and usually they go unnoticed. So another way to think of this is you might think of this as a default mental setting. And so we're always within ideology. We always have thoughts that are present to us that we know we have, but there are all these thoughts, uh, especially thoughts that are in culture and politics that we've just kind of assumed without questioning it. Um, those are the thoughts that are at the more ideological level, right? And there's a really wonderful speech if this still isn't clear, I like <laughs> I like telling this joke, which is not a funny joke, but it is a good joke for for sort of uh, explaining what uh, how ideology works. Um, I highly recommend if you have time. It's very short, uh, and I think you can find it online. David Foster Wallace was a really wonderful um, um, writer, American writer, uh, wrote in the '90s and then in the 2000s. And he gave a little commencement speech to a college. It was Kenyan College, I think. And in, in this commencement speech, he gives this joke, uh, which is really, really wonderful. And, and uh, I recommend reading the whole, the whole thing, but I will also tell you the joke. So he says um, that at some point you have these two little fish and they're, they're swimming along. Uh, and then this much bigger fish comes by. And the bigger fish says, the water's real great today. Like the water's nice today, right, boys? Um, and then he swims off. Then the one little fish turns to the other little fish and he says, what the hell is water? This is not a funny joke, but it's a wonderful way of explaining um, how ideology works. Ideology is like that water for those little fish that don't yet know they're immersed. It's all around them, right? This is how ideology works. It's those things that we're in that we don't know we're in or ideas or beliefs that we hold that we don't know uh, that, that, that we hold them. And so what we would do, um, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which we could go into this painting. And this might be one of the interesting things to do in commenting uh, and in discussion is what is ideological in this painting? What are the things that people during this time, or Jacques, or David himself, the painter, what are some of the beliefs and assumptions uh, that he held that he didn't know he was holding, or that are just dogmatic, that are just default settings, right? Um, what might some of these things be? There's a rich discussion to be had there, um, and I'd be interested to hear uh, what, you, what you all think about this. What is the ideological content in this painting? What are the things that are in there that people back then could not have been able to see, but we today can, right? But let's not get too much on our, on our high horse, uh, because of course, just because we have this historical vantage point, we can go back and say, haha, look at, look at uh, David, he didn't know that he was doing this, right? Um, and we know better now. Uh, well, we're still deep steeped in ideology. It's probably just of a different kind or of a different form, right? So one of the things that's really nice to do when it comes to art is to turn the tables and say, okay, fine, we can go back and judge David, we can go back and judge Socrates, we can go back and judge the, Fre the French revolutionaries, but what would they think of us? Uh, what does this work tell us about us in our own time, right? Um, either uh, there are some ways in which we're similar or there are some ways in, in which we've diverged and maybe that divergence is not such a great thing, right? Whatever it might be, it's a very nice thought experiment to start asking yourself, what would David or this work of art uh, think of our own present moment, right? It's an impossible thing to answer, of course, because it's gone and it's gone forever. Uh, but it's still a nice um, uh, exercise, thought experiment. And that gets to the most speculative, like the, the, the most conjectural tool that I'm, that I'm giving you um, in, this, in this first class. So I hope that was all clear. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you'll be using, um, I'm hoping that this will help you uh, when we start looking at works of art uh, and help you see how they're so multifaceted and that they can open up into so many uh, different directions, more even than the little th that I've given you in this intro. Okay, everyone, until next time, uh, take care.